I am with you always until the end of the world. In a small farming town in the land of Judah called Kerioth, a babe was born. And his parents were delighted, were very happy, and they looked forward to a promise of a great manhood. So they named the baby Praise. Friends and neighbors came and brought gifts, and there was much rejoicing. In another town, not far away, in the land of Judah, another babe was born. This town was called Bethlehem. Shepherds and wise men came to see him bearing gifts. And this babe's name was Savior. And many years later, the babe of Bethlehem met the babe of Kerioth. And our divine Lord Jesus called Judas to be an apostle. Judas. Judas. When you hear that name, what comes to your mind? You can share with me in one or two words. Betrayer, what else? Thief, how about a thief? How about a loser? A man who committed suicide. How about coward? Nobody said or thought demon or devil. How many thought demon or devil? I'm surprised nobody said that. But many of us, when we think of Judas, think demon or Satan. You know, I'm standing here and preaching the word of God. And most of you know me, you like me. You give me warm hugs. If I were to fall from grace like Judas did, what would you do? Well, the first thing you'd do is you would disassociate yourself with me. You would deny that you ever knew me. And if you have any CDs of my talks, you'd probably go and burn them or give them away. That's what you do. That's natural. That's what human beings do. We don't like failures. We don't like associate, be associating ourselves with failures. We distance ourselves away from failures. Judas was a big failure. His life was a tragedy. But you know what would be even a greater tragedy? if we 
did not learn anything from his failures. That would be a real tragedy. Sometimes, our church has many saints. We know many, many saints. What we tend to do is we put them up on a pedestal and we think they're of a very different order. Supernatural beings with supernatural grace and therefore different from us. So we disassociate ourselves from them. We think we're inferior, they're superior. And therefore we lose the lessons that their lives teach us. We fail to emulate and look up to them and improve ourselves. And with people like Judas, who are failures, what we do is we demonize them so we can distance ourselves from them and we fail to learn from their lessons that could save and improve our lives. Today, we're going to not disassociate ourselves from Judas. We're going to familiarize ourselves with him and we're going to learn from his failures and see what lessons we could learn and change and transforms our lives so that our lives do not end up in failures and disaster. Amen? Amen. That's a sign of hope. That's very good. That's the first time I've heard anybody clap on a topic like this. So before we look at the lessons, let us look at Judas. Who was he? What do we know about him? There's not a lot about him, but there are some things that we do know about him. First, his name, Judas Iscariot. Judas is a Greek version, a, a version of the name Judah, which means praise. And Judah was a very common name, a biblical name. Iscariot is also a Greek version of Kerioth, which is what I mentioned, a town in south of Jerusalem, about 25 miles south of Jerusalem, where Judas was born. Judas Iscariot, they called him to distinguish him from other Judases. His father's name was Simon. And that's basically what we know about him. He was a common man who came from a common family, from a common town. He was the only Judean apostle. All the other 11 apostles were Galilean. Where is Galilee? North or south? Don't tell me you don't know your geography. Galilee is to the north. Nobody has been to Israel, a tour of Israel. Galilee is to the north. So 11 of the 12 apostles were from Galilee, from the north. You know, they say sometimes the thing, the very thing that you're good at or you have an aptitude for becomes the source of most of your temptations. And that was the case with Judas. He was actually had a talent for administration, which is why he was given this job. But that became the source of a lot of problems for him. He was attached to the money back to the extent that he missed many of the messages that Jesus shared with the disciples. One of the message that I'm sure Judas heard and maybe was even targeted at him by Jesus, we find it in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 19 onwards. Do not store up for yourselves treasures in on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Instead, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where rust and moth does not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Judas completely missed this message. His heart remained very attached to the money back, to the treasure. 
Judas was so blinded by money that even towards the end of Jesus' ministry, when he was preparing to go to Jerusalem to suffer and to die and give his life for our sins, his friends Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they had a feast for him, a little party. And Jesus was there. And Mary, his friend, does something very special to honor Jesus. Do you know what she does? She takes, brings out a very expensive perfume and she anoints Jesus. And Judas and the other disciples are there and Judas, Judas sees that and he's furious, he's angry. And here's what the gospel tells us. Gospel of John chapter 12 verses 4, 5, and 6. At this, Judas Iscariot, a disciple of his, the one who was to betray him said, why was this perfume not sold for 30 pounds and given to the poor? And then in verse 6, he said this not out of care for the poor, but because he was a thief. He used to steal the money put into the common purse, which was in his charge. Can you imagine the, the money bag in the church? I mean, can you imagine somebody who is put in charge of that and he collects all of that and at the end of the mass he goes in into a little room and takes in. Can you imagine doing that with God's money? So it tells you, reveals something about Judas's character. He probably didn't even believe. He was so blinded by what he owned. What about us? How attached are we to our money bag? How attached are we to our possessions? How attached are we to our titles and our positions? In this season of Lent, Jesus is inviting us to loosen our grip on the things that we are overly attached to and tighten our grip on the kingdom of God, which is what Jesus wanted for Judas, but he couldn't do. That's the first lesson. The second lesson is Judas failed to believe. Judas just did not believe in the true Messiah. He knew Jesus was the Messiah. He believed he was the Messiah. But he had a notion of what this Messiah should be. He had the notion that this Messiah should be a revolutionary. He should fight for his right. He should fight for the rights of the Israelites. He should fight the Romans and deliver them from bondage. And maybe he had certain aspirations. If Jesus could do this and he could then be crowned the king of Jerusalem, maybe Judas could be the finance minister. Maybe he had these aspirations. Maybe he looked forward to this. But you know what? Over a period of time, he learned that this is not the kind of Messiah that Jesus was. Jesus was preaching a totally different message. He was saying, blessed are the poor. He was saying, the, uh, look to the kingdom of God, not to earthly treasures. He was talking about forgiving your enemies. He was talking about if you, someone slaps you on one cheek, show him the other cheek. And Judas became increasingly disillusioned. He lost his faith completely to the point that he betrayed him. Look at yourselves. And think about the Jesus that you believe in. Which is the Jesus? Which is the Messiah that you personally believe in? Is it the Jesus who suffered and died? Is it the Jesus who forgave sins? Is it the Jesus who lived with the poor, who lived himself in poverty? 
Is it a Jesus who forgave? Or is it a Jesus that you have sort of imagined in your own mind that would help you sort of fulfill your own personal agendas? Is it a Jesus who is mighty and powerful who come, will come and destroy your enemies, remove all your problems so that you can have a leisurely, easy life? Or is it a Jesus who says, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me? If you have believed in a Jesus other than the one preached in the word of God and the one that the church teaches us of, this is the time for us to return to the true Messiah, be honest with ourselves, and surrender our intellect and our will to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. The third lesson we learn is that Judas had a very privileged position, but he failed to get salvation. Did, Jesus, did Judas have a privileged position? Do you agree? You know, the prophets and the patriarchs look forward to the coming of the Messiah, to this great time, but many of them did not get to see and be or live in this time. But Judas was extremely privileged. Not only was he living in a time when all of the promises made to the people of Israel were being fulfilled, but he was actually talking, walking, being, learning from, eating with the Messiah, the son of the living God. And despite of all of this, Judas failed to believe in him. He witnessed all of the miracles, all of the great things that Jesus was doing. The healing, the deliverances, the raising of the dead. But Judas continued to remain a skeptic. Someone who just did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was his personal savior. You know, Jesus tells a little parable, and I'm sure Judas heard it. This was in uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 onwards. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. I'm sure Judas heard this parable. You know what Judas did? He sold the kingdom for 30 pieces of silver and then gave up his soul to the devil. Do you find it hard to believe that there are people who go to church every day? They listen to the gospel every day. They are being prayed for every day. They witness God's miracles every day and may still not believe, believe to the point of changing their lives and might end up in hell. Sobering thought, isn't it, for all of us? Let us reflect on our own lives and let us truly understand, not only believe, but see if that faith is changing our lives. See if our lives, our relationship with God is a right relationship. Judas consistently gave the devil a foothold. We've heard many times, I think even Brother Anil has taught about how temptations work and how the devil tempts us. It all begins with a thought. He always comes with a thought. And it is when we take in that thought, and that thought leads us to action, that we fall into sin. 
And when we give him that chance, he begins to take a foothold. And once he has a foothold, he can continue to influence us to the point that he can take control of us. We still have our will. God will never take our will. Judas did everything willingly, knowingly. You know, the Bible tells us that the devil is like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. Waiting? If he's strong, if he's hungry, why doesn't he just come and devour? What is he waiting for? What is he waiting for? He's waiting for our consent. Can you believe that? Satan waits for our consent. And he lures us. He lures us. When he gives us the temptation, he has a lot of enticements attached to it. And that is why we fall. Let's face it. The reason we fall into sin is because in that moment, it is pleasurable. It does feel good. Let's not deny it. It does feel good, which is why we fall for it. But then once we fall for it, the devil gets a foothold. And then he takes over. He comes through the window, through the kitchen, or maybe the bathroom. Then he gets in the kitchen and into the dining room. And pretty soon he's in the living room and he conquers it all. He's in charge. The lesson from this, the lesson from Judas we learn is that Judas gave the devil a foothold from the very beginning to the point that he, the devil so influenced him that he lost his ability to even say no to the devil. He was still, he still exercised free choice. When he betrayed Jesus, nobody forced him. He willingly, remember, went to the high priest and he made a deal with them. He had a choice. But he was so influenced by the devil that he lost his ability to make the right choice and he ended up betraying his Lord and his master. Judas had worldly sorrow which leads to death. As soon as Jesus, uh, Judas, I'm sorry I keep saying this. I'm not used to saying Judas so often. When Judas betrayed Jesus, when the deed was done, he felt pangs of remorse. He was horrified. He knew he had betrayed innocent blood. He felt miserable inside. He felt terrible inside. But he could have repented. He did not repent. He continued to feel miserable because by then, the influence that was upon him was slowly dissipating. See, this is, this is what happens to us. And this is what the devil does. He will come. He will entice you. He'll get you. He will take you to commit sin. And when you've committed sin, and when you have betrayed your God, when you would betrayed your faith, when you would betrayed your family, you betrayed your loved one, you've lost your possession, he will discard you like trash. He'll be there at the roadside, miserable. And then he's going to come to you and say, look, you are worthless. You are beyond forgiveness. It's better for you to just hang and die. That is the way the devil works. And that is the way the devil worked in Judas's life. Judas could have, he could have, after he realized what he had done, thrown the 30 pieces of silver and run back towards Via Dolorosa, where Jesus was on his way. He could have caught up with Jesus and he could have knelt down in front of him and say, Lord, have mercy on me. That could have been the 10th station of the cross. Judas repents and turns to the Lord. And he would have had 16 stations. Do you know why Judas failed to turn back to God? Anybody has any guesses? You know, when you realize you've made a mistake and you come to your senses, 
and you want forgiveness, you need to believe there is a Savior who can forgive you. But Judas did not have a Savior because he never believed in Jesus as the Savior. So he had no place to go. So he did the best thing he could to end his misery. So he continued to be lost. And then he committed suicide and he entered hell lost. No matter how far down the road we go, no matter how much we have sinned, God is ready and willing to forgive. Jesus is ready and willing to forgive you. Don't let the devil tell you, look, God has given you enough chances, you've blown them all, and there is no hope for you. There is, as long as you believe there is a savior, there is hope for you to repent and turn back to God, just like the prodigal son. The reason the prodigal son was able to return to his father is that he remembered and believed he had a father. Even though he had rebelled against him, there was a father, and that father was going to forgive him. Maybe he was going to be angry and upset, but he was going to receive him back. Brothers and sisters, just know, during this, as we come close to the, the Holy Week, that each one of you, no matter where you are at in your walk with Christ, how far down the road you have gone with your sin, with your problems, Jesus is ready and willing to wipe the slate clean. But, just like the devil, is waiting for your consent to deceive you. Jesus is waiting for your consent to say, Lord, I've messed up. Deliver me. Amen? Amen. Finally, <laughs> finally, Judas was lost, but he was replaced, and the work of God kept going on. Sometimes we have, we think we're more important than we really are in the things that we do in our work. How many of you think, you know, if you stop going to work tomorrow, your company will actually suffer losses and maybe will even close down? I think that sometimes. Trust me, trust me, nothing is going to happen. Nothing is going to be, I'll be replaced in a jiffy, I tell you. God does not need us to save the world. He can save the world with one word. But he chooses to work through us. He chooses, imperfect as we are, he chooses to work through us to continue his work. And if we mess up, and if we fail to turn to God, and if we, for whatever reason, say, this is enough, and we leave the work that God has called us to do through our baptism. We are his priest. We are his prophets. We have a mission. And we say, enough of this. God's work will not stop. Judas was lost, but he was replaced with Matthias. After the Pentecost, the apostles got together and they chose a new man to take his place, and he did a wonderful job. God's work will continue. He will not lose. He will be sad, but he will not lose. Who will lose? You will lose. I will lose. So remember, no matter what, we continue to stay on the path. We continue to stay in our mission. There will be tough times. There will be criticisms. You will fall. You will struggle. Sometimes you will feel it's not worth it. But remember, don't give up like Judas. Hang in there. Wait upon God. Go to him. Repent. Turn back to him. And he will give you the strength to go on.
Amen? Amen. I think I'm finished. But I feel like I want to make a prayer. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for this evening. Lord, we know that in your, the story of your passion, there were many characters. And we know that each of these characters have a lesson to teach us. We know that even a despicable character like Judas has many lessons to teach us. Often we've just sort of passed him by. During this Holy Week, we are going to hear about him, but we will again, we would have perhaps if we didn't spend time reflecting on his life, just passed him by thinking that oh, Judas, betrayer, demon, devil, failure. But we will know that even a despicable character like Judas has many things to teach us. And Lord, I know that I chose to speak about him because deep within me, I know if I'm really honest with him, with myself, I can relate to him. I can look at the life of Judas and say, but for the grace of God, there goes me. And if each of us are honest with ourselves, Lord, we know that there are times that we betray you so badly. And at least Judas was ignorant. At least Judas had not seen the resurrection. Judas had not yet seen the Pentecost. But we have, Lord, we are the post-resurrection people. We have seen so much more. We are much more privileged than Judas was because li we live in this time. We are the people of the resurrection, but we still end up betraying you. Sometimes for 30 pieces of silver, sometimes for a moment's pleasure, sometimes for a little bit of power in position, sometimes just so can we, we can feel that we are right. We betray you for the smallest things. And we make you go through the whole passion over and over again. And yet, you are so loving. You are so gentle. You are so generous. You are so comforting. And you are ready to receive us. You are ready to transform us. You are ready for us to get up and start walking again. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for Judas. We thank you, Lord, that you have still kept his name in the Bible. And we know that the reason you have kept his name and his story alive in the Bible is that so that we could realize when we have fallen, never to continue in the path of Judas, to stop, turn back, and return to you, receive your forgiveness, and receive your robe of righteousness, which we do not deserve, but which you have merited, and which you have given to us free of charge, and so that we could live with you in eternity. And as long as we are here, we could do your work and be faithful to you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and God bless you.